All right, hello once again. This is Jeff Scott of Blackhawk Technical College. I'm going to be continuing on in our Android Studio Development Essentials text, now in Chapter 8, and in fact, many of the next several chapters, just FYI, many of the next several chapters are very theoretical in nature. In other words, in Chapter 8, <clears throat> in Chapter 9, probably even in chapter 10, okay, we're not going to see any code. This chapter, chapter 8, which begins in our book on page 77, is an overview of the Android architecture. So as it says, the goal here is to provide a detailed view of the fundamentals of Android development. So the first thing they do is they start talking about what's referred to as the Android software stack. Where, as mentioned here, each layer and its corresponding elements are integrated and tuned to provide op optimal app development and execution environment for mobile devices. Now, you see the picture here <clears throat> on page 78. I've also got the picture because I went out to Google Images and found this, which is basically the same picture. It doesn't look exactly the same, but it's basically the same. And it's from an article that I found. All right. And the article has already been put out there on the P drive. Okay. So let's take this from the bottom. And on the very bottom, you see the Unix kernel, or I should, well, I should say Linux kernel. And as mentioned, positioned at the bottom of the Android software stack. The Linux kernel provides a level of abstraction between the device hardware and the upper layers of the Android software stack. So in other words, everything that has to happen that's op operating system related is going to virtually come and happen down here. They mentioned on the bottom of page 78, it is important to note that Android only uses uses only the Linux kernel. That said, it is worth noting that the Linux kernel was originally developed for use in traditional computers in the form of desktops and servers. Okay? So you can see some of the OS related things that are done right there. Then we move up to what's called the art. All right? And the art is basically the Android runtime. All right. When an Android app is built within Android Studio, it is compiled into an intermediate bytecode format that's known as a .dex format. Okay? Not a .class as we had with our regular Java programs, but this is a .dex. When the app is subsequently loaded onto a device, the Android runtime, the art that we're looking at right here, uses a process that's known as ahead of time compilation or AOT. That translates the bytecode down to the native instructions that are required by the processor. This format is known as ELF or executable and linkable format. Each time after that that the app is launched, the ELF executable version is run and that results in a faster application performance and it helps battery life. This is different than the JIT or just-in-time compilation approach that was used in older Android apps where the bytecode was translated within the virtual machine or the Java VM, the JVM, each time the app was launched. All right. Next, you have the libraries. In addition to a set of standard Java development libraries, the Android development environment also includes its own Android libraries. These libraries, as mentioned toward the bottom of page 79, are specific to Android development. Some of the key ones are shown on the bottom of page 79 and the top of page 80. Now, they're not shown here, but I want to mention a couple of them. Android.app provides access to the application model and is the cornerstone of all Android applications. So in other words, you're going to use it again and again. 
Again, I'm not going to mention all these to you. Android.OS provides applications with access to standard operating system services like messages, system services, and inter-process communication. Android.Provider, a set of convenience classes that provides access to standard Android content provider databases. Android.Text, used to render and manipulate text on a display device, or device display. Android.Util, a set of utility classes for performing tasks such as string and number conversion. Android.View, the fundamental building blocks of application UIs. Android.Widget, virtually everything that you create on a page is known as a widget, a button, label, etc. Even layout managers. All right. Now, not really shown there, but shown in your book is not only, not only are there libraries that are Java libraries, but really these Java libraries, as mentioned towards the bottom of page 80, are essentially wrappers around C and C++-based libraries. And they fulfill a whole bunch of different functions, all right? In practice, as mentioned on the bottom of page 80, the typical Android application developer will access these kind of libraries solely through the Java-based core library APIs, all right? So it'll be kind of an indirect way where you won't necessarily have to worry about it as much. All right, the application framework, which is the next thing up. It's a set of services that collectively form the environment in which app, Android apps run and are managed. It implements the concept that Android apps are constructed from reusable, interchangeable, and replaceable components. It includes the following services, and you can see them on here. There is an activity manager, which controls all the aspects of the application lifecycle and activity stack. Content providers, which allow apps to publish and share data with other applications. The resource manager, which provides access to non-code embedded resources, things like strings, color settings, and different UI layouts. The notifications manager, which allows apps to display alerts and notifications to the user. View system, which isn't even shown on the picture that you see here. That's a set of views used to create application UIs. The package manager, which is the system by which apps are able to find out information about other apps currently installed on the device. The telephony manager, which provides information to the application about the telephony services available on the device, such as status and subscriber information. Finally, the location manager, which provides access to location services to receive updates about location changes. Could be GPS related, could be anything. You know, it could be where you bring up Fandango and they ask if they can have your current location type of thing. Finally, at the top, are the applications. The applications comprise both the native applications provided with the Android application, for example, the browser and email, and third-party applications installed by the user after purchasing their device, and in our case, also third-party applications that we're going to create. All right? So that's everything that you see here. Finally, the author mentions here down towards the bottom of the page. A good Android development knowledge requires at least somewhat of an understanding of what's going on here. This is the kind of thing it won't help you a lick to memorize. But you should look at it and see at least if you can figure out how the stuff in here blends together. All right? And I'll leave you with the last sentence in the chapter. The key goals of the Android architecture are performance and efficiency, both in application execution and in the implementation 
of reuse in application design. So we're going to pick it up with the anatomy of an Android application in just a couple minutes.